Please welcome Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haynes, and co-founder and managing partner, West Exec Advisors, Michelle Flournoy. Okay. Hey. Good to see you. <laughs> All right. So we have saved the best for last. Thank you all for <laughs> sticking with us. So it's really my pleasure to introduce Avril Haynes, who is the Director of National Intelligence in the United States. She's the seventh DNI, but the first woman to hold the job. <laughs> Yay. Um, the DNI's job is to lead 17 different intelligence agencies in the United States and to lead intelligence integration and ensure that the intelligence community gives the best possible insights to our decision makers. Um, I got to know Avril during the Obama administration when she was the assistant to President Obama and the principal deputy national security advisor. Prior to that, she was the deputy director of the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, she was also the first woman to hold both of those positions, so we're seeing a pattern here. <laughs> um, she spent over 20 years in government, every, has worked in every branch of government, as well as academe. She holds a de bachelor's degree in physics and a law degree from the Georgetown University Law Center. Um, but a few fun facts. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> While attending the University of Chicago, she made some money on the side as a car mechanic repairing engines. Um, she's also an amateur pilot and founded an award-winning uh, independent bookstore in Baltimore. So a woman of many talents, and I can attest a wonderful colleague. But let's get down to, uh, down to business. Um, I to say that it's an incredible honor to be here with Michelle. For anybody who knows her, she is one of the most extraordinary national security leaders that we have in this country. Thank and you. I'm really grateful. Well, well, it's great to share the stage. Thank you. Um, so we are living in a very different world than when the U.S. intelligence community was designed. We have the advent of the internet, the digital revolution that's affecting every aspect of our lives, from our social interactions, our economic activity, our national security. Um, so much has changed. Everything is networked. So how is this impacting the U.S. intelligence community? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And I also just want to say how much fun it is to be here with all of you. I had a chance earlier today to interact with some of the RSA scholars who are some of the most extraordinary people I've had a chance to interact with in this space. But I also just having an opportunity to tap into this community is so important to us in the intelligence community. Um, in terms of how it's changed our work, I would say that uh, you know, there's sort of the tactical to the strategic. There's, of course, an increased volume of threats. There's increasing interconnectedness, frankly, of systems that make it hard for us as we sort of um, create an attack surface that has more high value assets uh, as a part of it. And, and all of that is obvious to all of you. What is, I think, sort of on the strategic end, that's something that I know you've dealt with and that we've seen in government over time, is that, in effect, this, you know, cyberspace and cybersecurity puts tension on a series of kind of key traditional distinctions that we make in our world in ways that are increasing. So these are distinctions for which there are other tensions, but I would say that in the sort of digital space, you see it enhanced in some respects, and I'll, I'll just talk through maybe three of them. One is the domestic international um, distinction. So for us in the intelligence community, this is obviously an important one. We have different rules under which we're collecting information domestically versus foreign and abroad, and this is an area where if you're really going to bring together the threat picture, you have to look across both the domestic and the foreign, essentially, threat space. And so much of the critical infrastructure 
that is you know, of interest to us from a national security perspective is in the United States, and we have to make sure that we're actually managing to you know, collect on adversaries as they are trying to attack assets in the United States, and often they're doing so from places within the United States on our infrastructure. So that is sort of one of the classic tensions that this creates for us in the IC. A second one that um, it's sort of interesting to pull apart, and particularly uh, because I have a background as a lawyer, this is something that we spend a lot of time thinking about. There are different legal regimes that apply to us in our activities in the U.S. government if you are um, in a time of conflict versus a time of peace. And uh, often the discussion, I think, you know, maybe 10 years ago on cyber issues focused on uh, for example, could we have a Geneva Convention for cyberspace, right? And thinking about this in the context of conflict, and of course we have seen cyber used in conflicts, but we've also more often seen what cyber incidents look like before you get to a conflict and before anybody is willing to call it a conflict. And this question of when you shift from one realm to the other, right, is important because it gives you additional response options from an international legal perspective. But it's also important in terms of how you're developing the rules of the road and what those um, actions in basically instigate or, um, or implicate. So in other words, is it a hostile action? Is it not? Before you even get to essentially a use of force. So that's another distinction that I think has affected our experience in these spaces. And then the third one I'd say is the public-private distinction, which again is, you know, obvious to this crowd in many respects. And I know it's actually wonderful to have a community of people come together that is government, industry, academia, you know, the NGO community, so many different parts of our world. But one of the challenges here is that so much of our critical infrastructure, our cyber infrastructure is privately owned, and that obviously has an implication for us in terms of trying to protect it and think about it um, in the context of national security. And it means that we have to, and you know, throughout our history, we've not been so good at it from a government perspective, collaborate with the private sector in really intense ways in order to actually address the challenges that we're facing. So I don't, that gives you some concept of some of the issues that I think are important to think about from our perspective on these. Yeah, so events. some very different and new challenges um, and risks, as you, you noted, from the type of cyber threats that we're seeing from everybody from criminal actors to state-sponsored yeah. actors. Um, at the same time, incredible opportunity. You, if you just spend a little bit of time walking around the booths here, just the eye-watering uh, new technologies, the emerging capabilities, the innovation that's happening. Yeah. So the question, this may be an unfair question, but from your vantage point, is cybersecurity getting harder or easier? Yeah, I, I mean, I think cybersecurity is getting harder, but what I'd say is that, it, it, I'll pull it apart in a couple of different ways. I think one is, we still, obviously, again, I don't need to tell this crowd this, but um, have not, figured out how to prevent intrusions of even sophisticated networks, right? And, uh, and that is a challenge, I think, that we're gonna live with. And the reality is we are, from an intelligence community perspective, we're not a shield, but we do provide warning. And that is really one of the greatest values that we can give, in effect, so that others can take action to the extent they can. But it has caused us to think about how do you, frankly, build a risk of failure into your systemic design? How do you actually manage systems in a way that recognizes the fact that you're not gonna be able to create perfect defense in effect? And that is one aspect of the work that we're doing and I think that's critical to um, addressing cybersecurity within the US government. And I'd be really interested in, in how it is that all of you think about this. I, I also look at it through a couple of other lenses. One is we talk, for example, in our annual threat assessment about you know, state actor cyber threats, which are ones that we've been talking about for a long time, and we all know what the major four are in this area. It's China, it's Russia, it's Iran, it's North Korea. These are the, the principal um, adversarial threats that we see in the cyber space. And yet, at the same time, we see growing transnational criminal organizational kind of cyber uh, challenges, cyber crime, ransomware, other things in that space that's continuing to um, expand. And 
we see increased commercial availability of really sophisticated offensive tools that make it harder uh, for us to manage and it makes it easier for other actors to basically um, obtain tools that then allow them to engage in pretty sophisticated attacks in a variety of ways. That much is a challenge. And then finally, I would say another aspect of cybersecurity that's getting harder from our perspective that I think is also critically important, including in the IC, is really the challenge associated with privacy and civil liberties in this space. Because I think as we're increasing the amount of data that's available, and the pandemic is a perfect example of where so much more data about us in our daily lives, whether it's for contact tracing or other things or health issues and so on, are becoming available, right? But data across the board that people are able to pull together in a variety of ways, particularly using data broker, commercial, available you know, information and so on, means that it's much harder to maintain essentially privacy and civil liberties in these spaces as you're trying to, in fact, protect people's cybersecurity on these spaces. So it's another aspect of it yeah. that I think is harder. So you, so you mentioned that partnerships are becoming critical in making cybersecurity more effective, whether it's domestic public-private partnerships between the government and the industry, or whether it's international partners um, and, and allies. Could you talk a little bit about the role of partnerships, um, what you see working, what where you know where we've had some lessons that we've had to learn. How do how do we strengthen those partnerships as a core element going forward? Yeah, it's it, I, I don't know if you feel this way about it, but I think for um, for me, I just decades in government. I, I've always had the talking point of we need to improve our <laughs> private-public <laughs> right. partnerships, right? It is extremely frustrating to still someday be sitting we're going to figure it right, out, exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> like, to, yeah, to still be sitting here and saying this, and and I do think that um, it, it, we have improved in some respects. Just there is enormous work still to be done, in my view, and uh, and so for us in the intelligence community, what I'd say is. A lot of our work, right, is focused on um, ensuring that we have the best collection that we can in order to be able to uh, effectively provide a landscape of the threats. That is both the sort of urgent crisis of, you know, a particular attack that we're focused on, or um, it's the strategic outlook of what is the threat that we are looking at for the United States, et cetera. As we do that, then of course, if we're in the context of a tactical, you know, particular threat, one of the key aspects of partnership will be providing that information to whoever it is that might be the victim. That could be private sector, it could be another country, it could be a variety of, you know, actors that we're looking at, and we want to be able to do that as quickly as possible, and we often do that through partners in uh, the U.S. government, and um, and yet being able to develop the mechanisms that allow you to do it real time is absolutely yep. crucial, and that's something that CISA and you know DHS has been working very hard and trying to improve. And I think they are really making some strides under Jen Easterly's uh, directorship, and I'm sure she'll talk about some of that when she comes. And that is one aspect of it. Another aspect that's kind of again parochially for me in the IC is also providing information to foreign partners about what is the basis of our attribution of a particular attack so that those partners can come out and say something about it and so that we can also share information that they may have and that we may have together to look at to make sure that we're you know analyzing the situation appropriately another aspect of our work is frankly for the more strategic work really working with so many frankly of companies that are represented here, industry, academia, NGO, others, to think about the strategic threat that we're facing. Because what we find is that um, we're not the only ones with analysts who are thinking about this, right? <laughs> we could stand to learn a lot from others. And we've started to do some work where we bring in essentially private sector companies, do some analytic work with them, learn from them, trying to do more of that on a more systemic basis so that we can actually begin to compare notes. And we have some interesting and useful information and also some terrific analysts on different issues, also on cyber, but also on functional issues, also on regional issues that can help to contextualize things in a way that gives you a better strategic picture, I think. So a lot of that. And then finally, I would just say, 
expertise. I mean, I think, you know, it will come as no surprise to anybody here that we are uh, in a competition for talent and we really need as much as we possibly can. And we recognize that people are going to move in and out of government and into the private sector and learn different things in different spaces. And that's as it should be in many respects. But it's critical to us to make sure that we're keeping those channels of communication open and that we're also brainstorming together about what responses can be and other ideas for how we can actually affect the challenges we're facing. Yeah. You mentioned the sharing of you know, threat information with allies and partners, and I think one of the things that's been remarkable to watch in the Russia-Ukraine conflict is the speed with which the intelligence community has declassified information, shared it with allies and partners to build a common threat picture, and really deny uh, President Putin the ability to assert a false narrative that was really not fact-based, um, which is, it, which is pretty, pretty, pretty different than how it's worked in the past. Um, but I wonder if you, reflecting on this conflict, and particularly, I mean, we're all seized with what we're seeing in the news on the ground campaign and what's happening with rocket and missile attacks, which is just tragic and horrible. But there's also a war going on in the cyber domain here. I wonder if you can comment on any lessons being learned from the Russia-Ukraine conflict in the cyber domain and what that means for what we should do in the future. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, honestly, in many respects, my first and best answer is that we don't yet know, just because the conflict obviously yes. continues. Mm -hmm. And I think there's still further chapters to be revealed on how this develops. And even with respect to Russia's use of cyber, you know, in many ways, I think people um, didn't see quite the level or scope of attacks in effect that they expected to see uh, combined with the invasion. And yet, I think, you know, we're still watching to see how Russia continues in this space. And, of course, we have attributed to Russia a number of attacks that have occurred thus far with respect to Ukraine, targeting Ukraine in particular, and, you know, their command and control, their websites, their emergency response, a variety of things that we've um, indicated thus far. So I, in terms of lessons learned, I, I think there are a few things. One is maybe just starting where you did on the point, just that the degree of sharing that we've done during this whole process has been pretty extraordinary. And, you know, from my perspective, um, a part of that was because as we entered into this, um, really the fall of last year, as we were starting to see the intelligence that indicated that Russia was going to, uh, you know, or was at least very seriously considering an invasion along these lines, um, we in, sort of um, encountered a fair amount of skepticism among folks. And when we explained to our policymakers and our policymakers went to their interlocutors, they found that there was a fair amount of skepticism about it. And as a consequence, the president came back to us and said, you know, you need to go out and share as much as you possibly can and ensure that, you know, folks see what it is that you're seeing and that um, so that we can engage again and perhaps have more productive conversations about how to plan for essentially uh, the potential of a Russian invasion. And in that process, we did a lot of sharing in this space with, you know, partners and allies, and we learned a lot from them in that process. And we also developed mechanisms for sharing that I think will help us in the future. And among the key issues was cyber, right? Like how would the Russians use cyber? How did we expect them? to engage in that in the context of a conflict, what were some of the things that we expected to see. And as the conflict has continued, and we've seen attacks like the VSAT attack, for example, that you know spread into Europe and other things like that, we benefited from the opportunities to you know share that information as quickly as possible and get it out, and then also learn about the impact from these spaces. But I would say that um, we are still looking to see how it is that the, the Russia cyber story develops over time. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, you mentioned the competition for talent and sitting with an audience like this, I have to circle back to that because you've got a, a, a whole room packed full of talent that the, uh, the US government would love to recruit to help, help yes. with cyber security. <laughs> yeah. So totally. like, what's your one message you would say in terms of um, getting people to think about ser service as le at least as part of their career. Maybe not a career professional, but 
you know, some aspect of, of service as part of a career in cybersecurity. Yeah, I, um, so I'll make my pitch, but I, I, Michelle, I suspect you too have this sense of um, the privilege of having had an opportunity to serve. And, um, and I will tell you, I think growing up, there were sort of three things that I hoped in my life I would have the opportunity for. One was adventure, honestly. Um, I love uh, adventures, I always felt like, you know, if you have great stories at the end of the day, you've sort yeah. of made it, and <laughs> um, and there really is nothing like the work that we do in the intelligence community to satisfy that in many respects, and if you enjoy that, um, I recommend this work highly. Another is the relationships that you make, the people that you get to work with. I think that, you know, so much of my personal uh, joy in work is based on who I get to work with. You know, if you don't like the people you work with when you wake up in the morning, I, don't, I just don't really want to go. And, um, and the reality is I can't, um, I can't think of a greater group of people than you find working on these kinds of issues because they're there because they want to be there. And they're there because they all serve a broader purpose. And that creates a team mentality that I think is just hard to replicate anyplace else. And when you talk to people who have been in government, I think they will tell you that is the first thing that they miss is the people, that, that extraordinary talent, that sense of purpose that all of you come together to do is just unmatched, I think, in so many different ways. And the third thing is really just that feeling of just wanting to leave your community in a better place than it was, in a sense, doing something that you feel, you know, is productive. And, um, and I, I do feel as if um, you have an opportunity to do that, but there's another part of this that particularly this group, I feel like, um, serves in that space, which is you, each of you, I, you know, particularly the scholars that I met today, I have, um, a diversity of thought, of experience, of perspectives that is absolutely critical in the U.S. government right now. And I just think that we will not succeed in the future unless we have many of you to shake things up for us and to make us think about things differently and to, you know, force us to re-examine a variety of things that we consider you to push along on. It is... Um, it's an exciting time, but it's also daunting. There's a lot to work on. And I think that, that hopefully that excites you in terms of the intellectual challenge that it presents, but also um, you know, the importance of the work that you can do in yeah. these spaces. But I, how do you? No, yeah. it's the, the mission that matters and being working with a group of people who are just as mission focused as you are and dedicated you know, no one's there for the big bucks, right? It's, it's really about <laughs> it's serving and getting something done for the nation and protecting the nation. So unfortunately, we are out of time, oh but God. please join me in thanking uh, the wonderful oh, Avril Haynes. Thank you so much. Thank you.